Hey everybody. Okay, it's Monday, one o'clock central time, and time to start reading a book. Um, and um, Guardians of Magic uh, was the runaway winner. Uh, that was a surprise. That's the book y'all want to hear first. So we're going to read it from um, one chapter at a time every day, or one or two, depending how long they are, um, until we're done. And by dinner time, the chapters we posted on YouTube, the um, the link is right here, and or you can write to me and I'll give it to you if you can't find it. Hope everybody's weekend had some fun in it. Um, probably going to see Lois running back and forth behind me. Here's her tail. And um, I spent the weekend trying to figure out how to make uh, bandanas for nurses. I've still got to sew the buttons where the pins are. This is so they can wear a mask um, and uh, put it around the buttons instead. A nurse in our neighborhood asked if we would do it, so we're all joining in. I had to brush off my very old Girl Scout skills, so shout out to the Girl Scouts. It took me about four before I worked out the bugs and remembered how to use my sewing machine, but I got there. Kind of glad to get back to, to uh, writing today. Writing is easier. Hello, Diane. Glad you're here. So we're going to do book eight of the Lyra Chronicles, Guardians of Magic, um, from beginning to end. And um, then we'll probably do War Mage after that, because that was the second, that was the runner up. We'll just keep doing this um, as long as we all are in our individual pods. And um, another fun thing this neighborhood is doing is they've asked us to put uh, giant hearts in our front yards with our Christmas lights, just make a heart on the grass in appreciation of uh, nurses. There's a bunch of, apparently there's a lot of nurses in my neighborhood and they asked and I'm happy to help. Um, you can find different ways to stay connected with each other. Um, Wednesdays, my neighborhood's doing a happy hour, Zoom happy hour with um, trivia games. So, you know, even though we can't hug each other and go hold hands or sit at the same table, we can find ways to stay connected. This Doing this reading is one of them for me um, and happy to do it. Also, I like visiting with Diane every day. So, um, you know, keep writing to me. Love hearing from you. Happy to write back. And, um, this doing Guardians of Magic is kind of timely since there's more Lyra coming out. And, uh, this will remind you of where the Austin part dropped, uh, uh finished up. And it, we can just spend some time together. And like I said, if you missed it, every chapter by dinner time, the uh, wonderful Grace, my admin, will have it up on YouTube. So, without further ado, here is chapter one of Guardians of Magic. The black swirl of mist seeped into hotel room 302 on the third floor of the Driscoll Hotel, emerging out of thin air and swirling in the room. It gathered in inky, puffy clouds along the carpet, spreading out under the bed and around the chair. A mild stench accompanied it that was hard to place and lingered on everything it touched. The maids were getting used to the smell clinging to the room. The temperature was quickly dropping 20 degrees as if the air conditioner was running amok. No guests were in the room. The room was still kept empty most of the time and only used when the hotel was overbooked and desperate. Many didn't last the night and would call the front desk complaining of strange noises and a peculiar smell and the cold. The worst was when they said they heard low moaning like something was trying to escape. Today they would have been right. A couple visiting Austin from Indiana were happily chatting as they passed by the room. I can't believe that Katie Rain. Her music was amazing. Do you have the directions to Stubbs Barbecue? I don't want to be late to the gospel brunch. The husband patted his pockets looking back down the hall. Did you hear that? The wife stopped dead in the hall right by the door, tilting her head to listen more carefully. She pulled her sweater closer around her shoulders, hoping she'd hear something easy to explain. There it is again, like somebody doing the ugly cry. Her husband put his arm gently around her shoulders and pulled her away from the door, a cold shudder passing through him. None of our business, dear, let's keep going. She moved away reluctantly, concerned about whoever was in the room. Sounds like someone mourning the dead, poor thing. You have a good heart, Ellen. You always did. Ellen got it half right. Lucius was a beast lost to the world in between and was crying out, determined to rip through the veil, mourning what was taken from him. The hotel room was one of the thin places in the world where the darkness could press against the light and it was giving way to the other side. 
The master of the dark mist was finally ready to show himself and seek revenge. Rosden. Lucius cried out the one name that had been on his lips for hundreds of years. A claw poked through, appearing in the room, tearing a long, thin line as the darkness sucked in the light from the room. He had been keeping watch on the room, building his power, sucking in the dark magic from lost wizards and elves and the occasional gnome. He was even branching out to humans like Charlie Monaghan. The bubble that was left in the veil by Lyra Barons gave him something rare in the world in between. Hope. On that, day, on that day that Mar Barons was rescued, a breach was open in room 302. Everyone filed out of the room, relieved after the rescue, not realizing the hole was never completely closed. Something had been working at clawing its way out ever since that day, reaching out looking for power, looking for Lyra Barons. Today was the day he finally could escape. There was a loud rip, as if Jello was being scraped out of a bowl with the edge of a metal spoon and an opening was created from the world in between. A large beast that was once known as a light elf named Lucius stepped through the opening and onto the carpet, leaving soggy puddles with each step. He let out a roar, opening his arms wide and bawling his hands into fists as he tilted back his head loose on the world again. The bellhop waiting by the elevator startled and dropped his phone in mid-text. Shit, what the? He glanced nervously down the hall at room 302. Not again. He jammed the elevator button, willing it to come faster, even though all he previously knew of the room were the stories the clerk behind the counter liked to tell him. Until that moment, he was sure she was flirting with him. He leaned over, keeping his eyes on the door and scooped up his phone as the elevator doors opened. He stepped in, biting his lower lip as another roar echoed down the hallway. Come on, come on, come on. He pushed the lobby button and used his key to make sure the elevator wouldn't stop at any other floors. I am so out of here and quitting this gig hard. Rather be asking strangers if they want fries with that. At least I get to keep all my parts. The beast went to the window and looked out at the bright day below, watching all the people wandering around 6th Street below, going in and out of the bars and restaurants, laughing and talking loudly. Rosden will pay for this. 800 years. Best part, the bitch will never see it coming. His last taste of freedom was at the height of battle as he stood by the great kings to defeat Rosden. He had his sword at the Atlantean's throat as he protected the old king of Orsaren. But victory was not going to be his that day. Rosden raised up an arm before he could plunge the steel into flesh and whispered a spell, sending a creeping darkness throughout Lucius' body. A startled look had come over his face just as he was shoved into the abyss of the world in between. The battle had raged on without him. Lucius moved around the room, feeling solid ground underneath his feet. He flexed his muscles, feeling the air on his skin. Been far too long. His veins pulsed black under his mottled pale skin, cursed a long time ago with powerful dark magic. It took some time, a few hundred years, but eventually he grew patient and learned how to bend all the darkness trapped in the world in between to his will, draw it to him, capture it and suck it dry to make it his own turned out the curse had a silver lining. It possessed a magic all its own. He learned to become his own relic, and even within the confines of the world in between, he taught himself about the curse. He learned how to become a shifter, turning into the beast, heightening his senses and feeling the trails of dark magic, even in the world in between. He sought out the other darkness, moving more easily through the gelatinous void, eventually gaining enough power to send out energy into the world. Lucius took a deep breath, inhaling as he lifted his chin again, focusing. The skin along his large arms rippled and the bones along his face shifted as he cried out from a familiar pain. He shook violently as his body quickly took on another form with the sound of bones cracking and reforming until a light elf stood in room 302 wearing full Orisaran leather battle armor, a scowl on his face. The curse had a very dark lining to it as well. It had poisoned Lucius a long time ago until all he could see was revenge and all he felt was rage. He opened the door to the hallway and surprised a young man on the way back to his room. The man quickly slid into his room and shut the door, locking it. South by Southwest always draws the crazies, he whispered as he stood back from the door. Lucius drew in enough magic to fling open the door in the room next to him. He rifled through all the belongings, pulling out clothes similar to what he saw on the street below. Somewhere in this world, Rosden still exists. I can feel it. The anger pulsed in his head. Nothing was close to the right size. He went to the next room and emptied drawers searching for clothes that would fit. Most of the guests were already out for the day, seeing the sights. 
At last, Lucius found a pair of jeans and a gray sweater, along with a pair of worn work boots. These will do. He looked at his reflection and noticed his pointed ears, pulling in energy from the curse and shifting the ears into something more rounded. That bitch is close, he growled. I can feel it. He shut his eyes, focusing on the distant trails of strong magic, and startled to feel something unexpected again. The trail of bright energy emanating from Lyra Barons that he had sensed even in the world in between. Stronger than anything he had ever seen in the living or the trapped. A missed opportunity that will have to wait. For now. Lucius left behind the jumbled hotel room and headed for the stairs. Years of watching people move around the streets of Austin had taught him something about how to blend into a crowd. Time to go hunting, he whispered, as a thick web of inky black crept through the veins on his neck. Turner Underwood jerked his head up from the lesson he was giving Lyra, his eyes widening. His hand reflexi reflexively squeezed the silver handle of his cane. What is it? Your fixer alert going off? Lyra was in the middle of practicing stepping into the middle of the light stream and back out again, learning to guide the energy more. How do you do that? I don't sense anything. Lyra wet a finger and held it up in the air. There's a nice breeze coming off the lake, though. Something's not right. Is there a disturbance in the force? Lyra lifted her left knee and left arm, pushing down with her right hand. What Tai Chi move is this again? Turner was using the ancient martial art to teach Lyra balance and to center herself in the middle of the light. Part the wild horse. Something's not right. You said that. Lyra noticed the look on Turner's face and dropped her arms, tilting her head to the side. You need to go help someone? We can cut it short. It's not one of our kind. At least I don't think so. Something is throwing off the balance. You mean besides me for once? Not sure how the whole fixer thing works, but can I help? Is that allowed? Turner cocked his head, listening to the vibrations of the different streams of energy that were always flowing by him from all the magical creatures in the world, shimmering bands of different colors of light flowing in all directions, some of them smooth and glittering and flowing in straight lines, others sputtering or tangling in small knots, surging ahead anyway. He heard the low rumble of the dark, pulsing wave. It's familiar, but he can't quite place it. His brow wrinkled and he shut his eyes, leaning on his cane as he held up a hand for Lyra to be quiet. I know this hum. He felt a tightness in his chest as the memories of the battle from 800 years ago came back to him, flooding him with memories. It's not possible, he muttered. You're looking a little pale, even for an elf there, Turner. What the fuck is going on? He blinked and opened his eyes, looking at Lyra. Just thinking of an old friend of mine. Thinking about friends doesn't usually put a look like that on my face. Rosden, maybe. Haven't thought about him in hundreds of years. Turner looked out over the lake, softening his gaze, still focusing on the trails of magic flowing past him. He was searching for a trace of this deep, steady stream again. Did I ever tell you that every trail of magic is like what a fingerprint is for human beings? No two are alike. They're uniquely shaped and leave energy trails that stretch around the world. Like their own GPS, I know. I've noticed even human beings have some kind of version of them. I've used it to track killers in my old job. True enough. And when you have loved ones, you become fam familiar with that energy flow to the point where it's like hearing their voice. Some part of you never forgets. Lyra stretched her arms over her head, tempted to take a run around Turner's large estate and stretch her legs. Has an old friend of yours come over from Orr Sarant? That's good news. That would be impossible. Besides, there's something off about the trail. Lyra stretched her arm across her chest. Only impossible if... Is your friend dead? I have no idea. He disappeared during the battle against Rosin a very long time ago. His body was never found. Turner scratched his forehead. There it is again. A low rumble of magic rolled by miles away, pushing other energy streams out of the way. It can't be. Turner's eyes moved back and forth as he sent out his own stream of energy to run nearby, but not close enough to get entangled. Dark magic. Very dark magic. The heavy string flashed and sent out a surge, knocking Turner's energy back into his body and throwing him backward, stumbling as he put out his arms to catch himself. Lyra easily crossed the space between them and grabbed Turner by the arms, connecting momentarily with his energy as she felt the remnants of the surge. What the fuck was that? Lyra slowly removed her hands from Turner, still hearing the buzzing in her ears. Okay, let me take back what I just said. Shit, no, I did not know what it was like to feel every trail of magic on the entire planet all at once. Mind blown, like some energy of life or something. An interesting way to look at it and not entirely inaccurate. 
Turner couldn't sense the heavy stream anymore, but the lingering doubts were staying with him. What was that low undercurrent? It was like some heavy pounding backdrop to the whole thing. Not a feel-good kind of groove at all. You could sense that? Yeah, it never went away. I could have sworn it even looked up when I touched you. Like a stream of energy was looking back at me. Very creepy. Almost like the dark mist. The smile dropped from Lyra's face and her jaw tensed. What's going on? What do you know? Not as much as I thought, apparently. More will be, more will be revealed, but hopefully we'll see whatever it is coming. And hello, Mike. Hi, hi, Sam. Hello, Diane. And um, oh, two Mikes. And hi, Nancy. Hi, I'm glad everybody's here. That's chapter one. Um, that's a great opening. Very exciting. And um, it's also a good reminder for the new book that's coming. I can't say any more than that, but this this was a time that you guys cleverly put, picked the right book to start with. Um, and uh, I hope everybody's having a good day. Like I said, I spent the weekend learning my old sewing skills again. It's functional. So the nurses in my neighborhood asked, uh, made a request if we could make headbands. And so, but I still have to sew the buttons on the side so they could hook their masks around that instead of their ears. So I haven't sewed in 30 years, but, and it took me all weekend to uh, kind of work the bugs out. But when I threaded the bobbin, I felt like a rock star. And I did finally get there. Um, and today back to writing, um, it's one day at a time for all of us, but we're all connected, um, and I can feel it and we're going to continue to find ways to stay connected. This won't last forever. Blessings will come from it and, uh, we will search for them and hold on to them and we will have each other. Um, the link for YouTube is in this, is uh, mentioned above. Uh, Grace will have the chapter up by dinner time, and um, we will do Guardians of Magic till we get to the end, and then we'll probably do War Mage, unless, you know, you guys speak up and say you want another book even more. Um, it's going to be group conscience. So take care of each other. You know where to find me. You know, if you need someone to reach out to, you can always reach out to me. I'm always here, and especially now. And um, I don't know if you can see Lois behind me. She's at the window. Nope. But she's, oh no, she's asleep now. She's not keeping watch at the moment. So um, take good care. I'll be back here tomorrow at one o'clock central time. We'll read chapter two. Uh, this is a very exciting book and it was a perfect one to pick. So well done guys. Well done. Without even knowing it, you did really good. And I will see you all later. Take care.